Finding Happy, Seven Steps to Relationships That Will Not Steal Your Joy is the new book by me, Nikita Banks, a licensed psychotherapist and life strategist. Leverage the knowledge you'll receive in this book to help you with the process of obtaining absolute clarity through the use of guided self-exploration. This process is necessary to help you master all your relationships in 2019 and beyond. Go on Amazon.com or BlackTherapistPodcast.com and grab your copy of the book guaranteed to help you redesign all your relationships based on two basic principles, health and happiness. Get your copy today. Welcome to the Black Therapist Podcast. The Black Therapist Podcast is a podcast where we discuss the unique issues people of color face when dealing with mental health issues and mental health diagnosis. Now, if you are new to our show, I am your host, author, life strategist, and psychotherapist, Nikita Banks, in private practice in my hometown of Brooklyn, New York. I am available for both psychotherapy and coaching sessions, and you can find more information about that on my website, NikitaBanks.com. You can listen to our podcast everywhere podcasts are found, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, YouTube, SoundCloud, Pippa, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and BlackTherapistPodcast.com. If you are a mental health advocate or a therapist and you want to buy our podcast merchandise, you can do so by visiting our site. And if you want access to our free mental health tips, free online trainings, discounted selective services, and resources, do so by joining our mailing list by texting "get happy" all one word to six six eight six six. If you love the podcast, please like, comment, and share. We love to hear from you, and if you want to send me some feedback, guest suggestions, or simply to say hey, you can contact us at our website, BlackTherapistPodcast.com. Please be mindful that this episode and all of the information that we provide here is just a resource and a tool to help get you started on your mental health journey. If you are feeling any mental health distress or you are having any significant issues, please feel free to reach out to us so that we can find you a mental health provider in your area. Okay, let's go. Hey, 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 hope you missed me. Now, it is uh, second week in October. We have survived, uh, I think, Black Mental Health Week. Was that was it what it was or mental health awareness week? I don't know. Something was last week, but it was also my birthday last week. So if you are a subscriber, then you've noticed that there wasn't a show last week. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. I don't know why you haven't. Um, but yeah, last week we we took I took some time off because I celebrated my birthday. If you guys have been following me for a while, you know my birthday is super duper duper charged with emotional triggers all over the place and so I um planned a evening out with my friends something low-key I usually try to do something like really simple going out with my friends I believe next year I'm just gonna go on vacation hopefully I can take a few friends with me but if I go by myself that would be really really cool too and so um yeah, I had plans with my with my partner, but I was like, my birthday's kind of charged. I really rather just hang out with my friends. So that's what I did. And it, it, it became an impromptu dinner party ish thing. Like we were really just supposed to go out to this party that I like going to because I get to go there and not be pretentious and I get to drink and have a good time and hang out with my friends and the guys all love me and the girls all cool and there's never been any violence or any issues at this party and the DJ is usually rum so I'm like let's just go where we usually go so I celebrated a week early. And if you've listened to the show before, obviously, you know that my son's birthday and my birthday is the same day. And so I'm really used to spending celebrating my birthday, either not on my birthday or um, before my birthday or after my birthday. Because, you know, if you're you have a kid on your birthday, (laughs) you end up making cake and ice cream for somebody else on your birthday. So, um. I don't know if you guys have noticed a few weeks ago, we started a new segment called what would you do? And I don't even remember what the last, what would you do was, I'm sorry, but the, what would you do for this week is about events, right? So I did 
have a lot of people that showed up for me for my birthday shout out to everybody that showed I did have some people who was like you know what I'm not gonna be able to make it and then I have some people who always come and they weren't able to make it and I'm I'm appreciative of them but then there are those people who RSVP'd and said they was gonna come and they gave me excuses and they called and they called and then they didn't show up or they gave me some stupid excuse. And while I'm a, if I'm a whole human being and a fully grown being, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm fully grown, highly seasoned, right? With Lowry's. I get that everybody has their own personal stuff, but I also don't understand why we live in an age of people who don't show up for you, expect you to show up for them. And then they go radio silent after. Like some people I haven't heard from at all, like not a birthday wish when my actual birthday came, which was Friday, not a phone call. And so I got into a conversation with a friend of mine who we started talking about an event that she had recently. Shout out to you. I don't want to call your name, but she was she was very disappointed because she had celebrated an event and nobody showed up for her. And I really want to know how you guys handle that. I mean, I, I, I think I handled it pretty well. I'm going to probably have a conversation with the person with several people, but one person in particular I'm going to have a conversation with because I feel like friendship is about who you can, who you can depend on, especially at this day and age. Like you get older, you want to have good friendships. You want to be able to count, count your friend, um, in for certain things you want to know that you can show up for them i'll show up for you and if you can't just tell me like i'm a big girl i can make other plans for myself all right so guys if you have a friend or a family member or somebody that you always show up for and they don't show up for you what would you do if you invited them to an event and they did not call you you, they did not cancel on you they just didn't show up and then you haven't heard from them for a few days later like what would you do how did you resolve this issue and 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 not calling them at all is not an option or not speaking to them at all is not an option. Like we have to be adults about how we resolve issues. And so what approach would you, would you, you take to resolve the issue in a adult, um, more evolved manner? All right. This is somebody that you love and you care for and you support, not somebody that you can throw away. Or not somebody that you you feel like, that you want to throw away because you can say I, I never speak to them again. That's that's the easy, that can be easy way out sometimes emotionally. So I'm saying this is somebody that you love and you support, but you want them to know that hey, I need you to show up for me the way that I show up for you. Like how would you address that? Okay, and I will tell you how I would deal with that on next week's show. And so um, I'm gonna get into this show. So I follow someone's account on Instagram. And I saw this post, and I'm not going to lie, it rubbed me a little bit the wrong way. So I'm going to read it. I'm not going to call no names. Not today, no shots fired. Um, This is definitely not subs, but I, I thought that it was a really good topic to talk about today. It was emotional for me when I read it. I kind of felt like it rubbed me the wrong way. And I, I feel like it, it, it needs addressing Um, in this forum. So I'm going to have... Yeah, I'm just going to read the post. <laughs> okay. All right. So the post says therapy is an inherently colonial Eurocentric individualistic misogynistic paradigm. Whew. Okay. The comment or the caption. I have concerns about therapy. Therapy plus 2019 equals archaic. People need a variety of tools to embark on healing, period. I am a critical lover of my craft. Hence, before you become defensive, therapists check your shit and look at how you too have become colonized by these systems. First of all, this person is a therapist. I want to say that off top. Or identifies themselves as a therapist. I don't know whatever, you know, I don't know nobody online, right? There is a heavy emphasis on individual issues as though a person's life is in a vacuum. The person seeking support is viewed as sick or mentally ill. Why do we use these medical words to depict support? Once a week, 45 to 60 minute per session. What are the structures in place for the other six days and 23 hours? Treatment. Period. I don't know what that means. Groups are inherently a part of 
most therapy, pra- oh, I'm sorry, groups aren't inherently a part of most therapy practices, not as a choice, as a collective necessity. Presenting problems, that's in quotes. A board gets to the, oh, I'm sorry, a board gets to decide who should practice therapy and who shouldn't. Despite years of schooling and unpaid labor internships. No contact for two years post-therapy. This is violent. Eurocentric AF and traumatic, especially for those living with attachment-related difficulties. See one therapist slash practitioners at a time. No duplication of services. God forbid we collaborate and provide a person with the agency to ask for what they need. Trauma etymology or etiology, I'm sorry. Symptoms and theories, plural, should be mandatory foundational courses in grad programs for therapists, social workers, counselors, and psychiatrists. CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes, helpful. I love a good cognitive distortion convo and... What's whiter than focusing on your thoughts over and over and willing yourself to stop it? I know, I know I'm simplifying. Sounds like restriction to me. We treat grief, abortion, miscarriage, and infertility as one-time events to get past rather than points of complex trauma. We are not mandated to look at our own histories of privilege and oppression and incorporate it into our therapy. No focus is placed on helping those we work with to connect with activists, organizations, groups to facilitate change outside of the room. Are we create, I'm sorry, are we considering economic barriers to care? We need to prescribe rest. We expect the systems that harm us to bring us to the river of health. This is the definition of insanity. Tell me people, what would you like to add to the list? So. I read this post and immediately I was like, damn, this is cringeworthy. And I, I'm, I'm, I hope that the goal was to start a dialogue. You know, I love me a good dialogue. I saw it. I think I commented on the post, something very simple, like, girl, you oversimplifying simplifying what I, it is that I do. But I wanted to take time today to number one, explain to you dismantle this, this, this thinking. I'm going to dismantle this thinking completely. Number two, explain to you why this is, is as to the stigma of black people not getting therapy. And it feeds into this narrative that this is just a white institution and think something that's good for white people to do and black people shouldn't be involved in it. And it's not made for us. It's a system not built for us. We know that, but you know, there are leading psychological theories that are based on Afrocentric care and treatment for our complex trauma and our shared history across the diaspora. So the fact that a therapist who calls herself being inclusive, being culturally competent, being culturally responsive would give such a well thought out argument against general therapy would generalize therapists in this manner and trivialize what it is that I do as a black therapist and what this person does as a therapist of color I'm not sure if she's black or whatever because I mean I, I just see a lot of memes and stuff like this on her page but I don't know if this and, and the page is pretty popular I don't know if she, if they understand that it is not a positive view of what we do in therapy. Okay, so I want to break this down point by point. And then I'm gonna try to make the points that I just made, but I probably forgot what the three points that I just made. I know I'm just gonna break this down. Hopefully I cover those points because I'm gonna forget. Okay, therapy is an is an inherently colonial, Eurocentric, individualistic, misogynistic paradigm. I don't know about anybody else, but when I've, when I study restorative practice, restorative practice is nothing but Indian healing circles. If you don't know anything about restorative practice or restorative justice, it is this, this brand new 
and I say that in air quotes, white people got, got a, um, a hold of what we, we use as a talking stick. If anybody knows anything about Native American history, a talking stick and sitting in a perfect circle to to hash out your issues, that is Native American. So to, for you to say that all therapeutic practices are based, and I'm, I'm generalizing because I feel like this is general, is based on a Eurocentric, colonial, and uh, individualistic practice is not true. The majority of the things that we heal in my practice is family dynamics, teaching people how to work within their family system, teaching them how to succeed in larger society. Now, now we do live in a co- colonialized society. Uh, you would never hear me not say that, you know, white, white thinking, Eurocentric ideas are dominant in most environments. Yes, it is predominant in therapy, but that don't, but to say therapy is an inherently colonial Eurocentric individualistic misogynistic paradigm, that's a large leap. And it negates the people who are people of color in this environment that are doing the work like this person says that they're doing, like Dr. Rev Billings is doing with um, dismantling racism. And I'm going to name a lot more because it's not a just, I know most of us know about Freud and Gestalt and Freud's daughter and um, Maslow. I know that a lot of, if you, if you think about it, yes, it, it is Eurocentric because a lot of these the theories that we studied in school are eurocentric but the but the theories that i employ in my practice it's all afrocentric they're afrocentric so to generalize all therapies and therapeutic values to euro a eurocentric idea is bs and it feeds into the stigma and the narrative that black people should not be going to therapy. I have concerns about therapy. Therapy plus 2019 equals archaic. Okay, I guess if you think so. People need a variety of tools to embark on healing. Who doesn't employ a variety of tools? Who doesn't employ a variety of, of tools? If you are a, th- a therapist and you are only doing Freudian therapist or th- therapy, ugh, psychoanalysis or CBT or DBT or EDMR, whatever that everybody's the rage about right now or tapping or attachment theory. If you're only using one of those theories, shame on you. Shame on you. I, I'm a I'm an artist with my shit, and I like to use all of the tools at my at my disposal. If I've tra- I've trained in it, if I've learned it, if I've mastered it, if it if it brings a reduction of symptoms to some of my clients and an improvement in life to others, then I am happy to use it in my practice. So people need a variety of tools to embark on healing. I am a critical lover of my pra- my craft. Hence, before you come, become defensive, yada, whatever. Um, look at how you too have been colonized by these systems. I I fight the system every single day because I'm a black therapist who works in an all black neighborhood who sees the majority black clients that I choose, that choose me. This is not the, what I see when I see clients on a psychiatric unit. They're Jewish clients that don't want to be bothered with me because they will tell me straight off the back, yo, I go to somebody in my, 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 um, synagogue, my rabbi is going to find me somebody. They let me know immediately. You're not in my, my community. I'm not really messing with you, but they don't have a choice, but to see me because of the, the nature of the work that I do in that setting. But even in that setting, as a clinician, I have a choice to say whether or not I want to see that client. I transfer clients all the time. So me as a therapist, I have the autonomy, the autonomy to see what clients I want to see. And me being a black therapist in private practice, in, in the hood, in the hood that raised me, seeing my community is an act of a revolutionary act. 
So to say that I'm colonized by the system is, I take offense to that personally. And I'm not getting defensive. Because one thing about about me, and I've probably said it a thousand times on this show, I'm extremely introspective. Okay? So there's that. There is a heavy emphasis on individual issues as though a person lives in a vacuum. The only variable you can control in society is yourself. And even God, if you believe in God, even God allows us the ability to choose to worship him or not. Why would there not be an, an, an emphasis on individual issues when, when you have to deal with yourself as an individual? This is a treatment. This is a treatment of mind, thoughts, feelings, emotion, and behavior mastery. That's what we do in therapy. So why would it not be about the individual? You have to start at with the individual, with your own individual experiences where you are. So yeah, there is a lot of work and a heavy emphasis on individual issues, but that is not all we do. That's not all we do. If you grew up in in a traumatic environment and you've suffered trauma, you've been molested, you've been raped, you've you've had your experience dismissed and denied by your family, your mother was a crackhead or you grew up in foster care, you never knew your father. Like how how can you deal with the family system who a lot of us are in denial about the the situations that we've grown up in. A lot of our families still shame us into silence. How are we going to deal with the family stuff if we don't deal with the individual issues? So yes, there is a heavy emphasis on individuality because we all have the individual freedom and autonomy to choose and decide who we become in life, how we are represented in society, how we move through life in this system and become very successful with the roles that we we choose to to involve ourselves in the roles that we play in society at, at large in our community and in our families it's just <sighs> yeah but that's not all we do I do couples counseling I do family counseling I do um, critical intervention. I do work with children, which is family work, which is systems work. I do all of that stuff. So let's not make an assumption. The person seeking support is viewed as sick or mentally ill. Why are we using these medical words to depict support? I don't have a choice in that because most, if black people would pay my rate, I would not legally be obligated to put that the person is sick or mentally ill. The majority of the clients that I see, they don't, they're not sick or mentally ill. The majority of clients that I see, they have mental health issues. The majority of the clients I see, if I have to give them a diagnosis, it's adjustment disorder with mood disturbance or mood regulation or dysthymia or anxiety. Not that doesn't mean you're anxious all the time. That means that you had you, you your sense of safety is in jeopardy. I don't have a choice of whether or not I put a diagnosis on a on. I mean, okay, well, I guess in that point, then yes, how I have been colonized by these systems. I work in a system. I don't know any anybody that doesn't work in a system. Most of us all work in a system. So I work in a system. In order to, to get paid, I have to put a diagnosis down on a piece of paper unless you pay me cash. And even still, if you pay me cash, I still have to give you a diagnosis that's between you and I. And it can be grief. It could be bereavement. It could be adjustment disorder. It could be it could be um, loss. It could be a personality disorder. It could be a personality type. It could be... A particular presenting issue that we're treating like it's not everything is not all schizophrenic and labeling you're labeling your like it's not all that bad but if more people invested in what happens inside of their heads and spend money on that instead of like bundles and like earrings and stuff and I'm not judging because I got bundles in right now um we wouldn't have to work within the system 
I, I, I have to work it within the, the world that I am presented with, you guys. <laughs> I wasn't born in the 1800s. I'm not born in 2027. I'm, this is where I am right now, and I have to succeed in the environments that I am, and I have to make the changes and the investments that I'm, I'm making right now. Okay. Once a week, 45 minutes. Oh, wait, I want to go back. A person seeking support is viewed as sick or mentally ill. Why do we use... Are we using medical words to depict support? We work in a medical system, number one. Number two, we do that for billing. Number three, we do that so that we can use evidence-based practice to help people reduce symptoms. And when I say reduce with symptom reduction, that means whatever emotional disturbance or life disturbance or issue disturbance that is is there as a result of the stressor we need to be able to to find out what the symptoms are what the problems are most people don't come to me some people come to me and they say well I think I'm depressed right and I say what does that mean they have a lack of concentration they have a you know mood regulation issue they're crying a lot they are thinking about death or preoccupied with dying or they have a fear of death that's overwhelming they're eating too much or eating too little uh, they're, ha they're suffering from insomnia or they're sleeping too much, right? They have a lack of energy. I'm not, nobody comes to me to treat depression. Everybody comes to me to treat those symptoms. So I have to know well, what, what, what makes you believe that you are depressed. It's no different than when I go to a mechanic and I, I say, oh, my car won't start. And then they ask me, well, what happened? You put the key in and then what? Did you hear a noise? Did it make a t t You guys know what I mean when I say, <laughs> when I say t that means the starter is going, right? If it made that little noise, if nothing happens and there's no lights on, that means that the battery is dead, right? If it starts and then it, it rumbles a little and it shuts off, that means that there's a gas, they probably don't have no gas, right? It may be the alternator. Like you can't fix it if you don't know what the problem is is that's all symptoms are symptoms is what's wrong now what's wrong with you okay um once a week 45 minutes 60 minutes per session what are the structures in place for the other six days and 23 hours not everybody comes in for 45 minutes 60 minutes per session once a week there are people that go to therapy five days a week there are people that go to therapy uh, three days a week. There are people that come to therapy twice a week. There's people that come to therapy once a week. There's people that come to therapy once every other week. The stru what structures are in place the other six and six days and 23 hours. Guess what? I can't control my clients. My clients can't control me. They're, they're not, they don't live inside of my therapy practice. They have to live in society. So they have to take what I teach them well, take what I give them and see if they can actually go out in society and function. They got to go outside to society and function. I go to therapy every week myself. And then I got to go outside and see if I remember what I was taught. Same with school. Same with church. These are systems. No. I don't know what's wrong with that. Treatment, period. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. Groups are inherently a part. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep saying aren't. Groups aren't inherently a part of most therapy practice, not as a choice, as a collective necessity. Not everybody needs to be in groups. There are a lot of people who have trust issues. I was recently asked to, to run a women's group in Brooklyn, New York, and I have Saturday hours. I'm really th considering doing one for Saturday <sighs> my only concern with it is that trust is a factor for a lot of us we don't trust other women a lot of us we don't trust other members of our community it becomes very hard to share somebody usually dominates group time You even if you have group therapy you should get individual treatment that's just my thought but I've worked in plenty of places I don't do, do groups where I am right now and like I said that's just 
for a, a matter of time. However, I've been telling you guys, I've been I've been planning to do online therapy groups for a really long time. And that's something that I'm definitely going to going to be starting in 20, 2020. Uh, towards the end of 2019 if you are interested in our online therapy groups make sure that you sign up to our mailing list and whenever I send you the next email just let me know you want to be on our group therapy um, stuff and we can we can discuss any issues that you want to I think online group therapy actually will probably work a little bit better because people will be able to kind of maintain a sense of anonymity and say what they want to and be able to feel included. But for a lot of people, group work is really, really difficult and not something that they can do because there are trust issues and group cohesion has to be done for a clinician it's extremely difficult to do group work that's why you heard me give out my rates early $240 is what I charge for two people in the room I really should charge a lot more for group rates and I'm I, I know that for a lot of people $240 for me making seems like it's it's expensive but number one I live in Brooklyn New York my rent is expensive number two it's a lot of work because when you do group work, you have to hold space for everybody in the group. You have to make sure that everybody is respectful. You have to make sure that any issues in the group is resolved in the group before you leave the group. And you have to make sure that everybody is respectful of the fact that what is said in the group is anonymous. It's kind of like, what is that? Alcoholics Anonymous or um, N.A.? I've never gone to those groups, but I have sat in the groups just because of the nature of my work. But yeah, it becomes a very difficult and specialized form of therapy that not everybody can take to. And a lot, if you are a paranoid schizophrenic, you're not supposed to be in a group with a bunch of people talking to you. You got trust issues. If you're a narcissist, you may not want to be in a group or you are, or you don't may not want a narcissist in the group. So there are certain types of personality disorders and certain types of diagnosis that do not do well in groups so that's very general it should not groups should never be um should never be mandatory unless it's part of a judicial system and that, that is what it is unless you're mandated and you're a mandated client and you got to go to groups for whatever reason and you're a danger to society then yes that that's a whole nother thing I, I don't have nothing to, to think I don't really have an opinion on that but in terms of like general people seeking therapy they should not have to be in groups on a mandatory basis. It's not helpful. <sighs> what I will say is that I do find that group work for certain environments, for certain people is extremely helpful. If you have social anxiety, groups could could present a challenge to you, but they may also help you get over those things. If you are dealing with grief or dealing with a family member who has mental health issues, you definitely want to have group support. So I'm not saying no to groups as a whole, but I am saying that groups should be voluntary to a certain, to a certain extent. And there are some therapeutic reasons that people should be put in groups for their own benefit. Okay. So where was I? A boy gets to decide who should practice therapy and who should, and despite years of schooling and unpaid labor internships. Yes. Yes, we should have a board. We should have a board. And if you, if you don't like the way things are doing at the board, you should fight for your seat at the table. There's NASW. There's um, Black Association of Social Workers. There's Black Association of Psychologists. There are a lot of our own boards that we can be on and be heard and make sure that we have a cultural, culturally competent platform on these boards. But yes, I want my therapist to be board certified and I want them to know, I want to know that they are able to meet the, the necessary standards and criteria across the board despite years of schooling and despite being able to to pass internships because let me tell you as somebody who has supervised interns there are some people out here who can go to school who could pass the school work who have absolutely no business working with people of color absolutely no business working with vulnerable populations absolutely no business working with people who are marginalized absolutely not 
So, so if there's one extra barrier to, to weed out bad apples, I'm for it. I'm for it. No contact for two years post therapy. This is violent. I I don't even know which, which, what she means because I speak to my therapist all the time. Not all the time. Now I'm not calling him on the phone. It's not, I'm not crossing any boundaries, but there have been times that I've, I've not gone to therapy for a year and I called them and I was like, I need to come in. And he was like, come in. And there's been times my clients and I have terminated, but they're like, you know what? I like to come in and I let them come back. So I don't know what that's about. No contact post therapy. Uh, that's not a New York thing or a thing in any of the states that I'm licensed in. See one therapist practitioner at a time, no duplication of services. God forbid we collaborate and provide a person with the agency to ask for what they need. That's not true. I have clients who are in individual counseling with me. I have clients who are in marital counseling with someone else. I have clients who are in group counseling somewhere else. My clients see psychiatrists that I collaborate with. Um, I've referred clients who come to me for couples counseling to a colleague for individual counseling and we, we collaborate. So I'm not really sure where, I don't know what that means. Trauma, etiology, symptoms, and theories, plural should be mandatory foundational courses in grad school for therapists and social workers. That's presupposing that they're not. Like I took courses on trauma. I took courses on complex trauma. I took courses on trauma symptoms. So I'm not really sure what she's talking about. CBT, yes, helpful. I love a good cognitive distortion convo. And what's wider than focusing on your thoughts over and over and willing yourself to stop it? I know I'm simplifying. Well, if you know you're simplifying, then why would you put that out there to the world? Like, why would you put an incorrect depiction of what it is that we do when we're doing cognitive behavioral therapy? And you're teaching somebody to master their thoughts, to master their emotions, to master their actions. Why would you simplify it? We treat grief, abortion, miscarriage, infertility as one-time events to get past rather than points of complex trauma. Who treats them like that? It is complex trauma. Nobody treats it as one-time thing. Nobody does. If you're a good therapist, so I don't know what they mean. We are not mandated to look at our own histories of privilege and oppression and incorporate that into our therapy. Who is we? Gee, who we? Because I check my privilege every single day. I know that I'm privileged. I live in an environment where I have access to the best social services care probably uh, in any other state I have access to top notch medical care whether or whether I do or don't have medical services get Medicaid or whatever there's no barriers to that our state facilities in New York City are top notch I mean, relatively speaking, I wouldn't say that if you went to Brookdale or Woodhall, but (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Like, even in those places, you're going to get decent psychiatric care. I know that I'm probably more employable than some black men, but I still earn less than them. I still, I know that I've gone to an Ivy League university or, well, postgraduate. I've, I've gone to... Like I've gotten a pretty good education. I'm educated. I'm smart. I'm black. I'm able-bodied. I have two legs. Both my eyes and ears work. I, I'm not mute. I'm in my right mind. So yeah, I got privileges and I know those things and I, I bring them into, I'm, I'm cisgendered, I'm hetero. I bring all those things to my sessions. Who says that I don't think about them? 
And we are mandated to look at our histories of privilege and oppression. But not a lot of us are able to incorporate it into our therapy. That I will agree with. More people who are not people of color should have to do more work. That's one thing I will say about NYU. The dismantling racism course that I took in NYU, it was an elective and it shouldn't have been. So that's one thing that I will agree with that some are not mandated or were not mandated. That's a fact. Not in, in NYU's program. I can't speak about anybody else's. But you do have to take oppression, racism, diversity, and privilege in it at NYU's course. So then we are mandated because you have to take that. It's a drop class, diversity, racism, oppression, and poverty. That's a mandated course. And you do have to examine your race and your privilege and the oppression of marginalized societies in America and look at the history of that in American society. You do have to do that in that class. But whether or not you do that, the individual work, there's no gun to any of our heads telling us we got to do any of this. No focus is placed on helping those we work with connect with activists, organizing groups to facilitate change outside of the room. Lies. I am a social worker. Which means, and I've said this many times, what I love about social work is I don't only do diagnosis and treatment, but I also create access to services that that are outside of me you have heard me on the show said i've done some of my clients resumes i have sent them for housing i've done housing applications i've i've saved people from losing their section eights ssi apps community um community what is it called Community-based organizations. I blanked out yeah, for a moment, y'all. And most of, most of the social workers that I know do do that. And we do it wherever we are. There are hospital social workers that I know that do that. Two, two, I always say this wrong. 2-20-10-E. If you live in New York, a 2 10 e 2-20-10-E e is a housing application that you can apply for if you are, if you have a mental health diagnosis. If anybody here knows that New York housing is a, is a commodity, but if you could get somebody to do that application for you and to submit you a biopsychosocial, you are ahead of the game. That application is not done in hospitals, but I know hospital social workers who do them. I know hospital social workers who buy clothes for the clients and make sure that when they're discharged from hospitals, they have places to live and places to go. So don't tell me that we're, we're not connecting them with community-based organiz organizations because a lot of us do. I make referrals to services all day, every day. Are we considering economic barriers to care? Yes, I am considering economic barriers to care. And for that, I have created a uh, mental health course. If you guys are interested in it, you could reply with, no, don't reply where you are. Go to blacktherapistpodcast.com. Go to blacktherapistpodcast.com and you'll be able to go get the free course. There are free and low cost therapy sessions that you can get in communities all across the country. You don't have to come to me. And there are a number of resources. A lot of therapists see clients on a sliding scale. I still see clients in environments where they don't pay my full rate. I still do. I am, you know, I take some of the Medicaid health plans in New York City, not in my private practice, but in other places that I work. And so you, you're still going to get the same care from me, whether you pay my full rate or whether you get, you come through an insurance-based plan or an EAP-based based plan, or if you come into some of the other places that I consult at, you're going to still get the same quality of care. We need to prescribe rest. I can't control whether or not people rest. I wish I could afford to rest. That's me. I wish I could afford to rest. I took five days off for a vacation. My, my consulting job kept calling me to, and asking me, why well, are you going to work? Are you going to work? Are you going to work on my birthday? No, I'm not going to work today. 
but I have the luxury to afford to say, I'm going to take five days off and do nothing. And I'm still working. I'm doing this show right now within the five days. I got to do my social media stuff within the five days. I have other projects that I'm working on within the five days. But I just didn't even have to leave my house. I didn't have to see clients. And guess what? Clients still booked me for tomorrow that I'm probably going to still see. But I, but that's at my discretion. I can't tell somebody who is living, you know, uh, earning a living wage and they're the they're sole breadwinner in their family that they sh- should rest. That's arrogant and it's classist and it's out of touch and it's off base and it's not fair. It's elitist. We expect the systems that harm us to bring us to the river of health, but this is the definition of insanity. While I can't disagree with that statement, I don't see anybody going back to Africa. I mean, I'm going in January, but I'm going for a wedding. I ain't staying. I got, I'm getting a round trip ticket. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't see anybody else going back to their court country of origin. I see all of us creating roots in this system because regardless of, of what's going on in society, regardless of what's going on politically, regardless of that asshole of a president that we, we have right now, I hope they impeach, regardless of all of these things, this is what we have. At the core, the core value of, of social work and the core value of therapeutic interventions is to be able to teach people to navigate the environment that they currently live in. Not all of us have access to just get up and leave. Not all of us have access to just change our environment if we live in an environment that has high crime and high poverty and low wages and all these things. Not, not everybody can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So to be like, oh, well, the system, the system, what is the alternative? If I can't learn to navigate the system that I live in, the system that I can't possibly buy myself while I'm working two jobs and, you know, working a minimum wage job and trying to go to school and raising my children and, you know, fighting the system and trying to keep the the rain off my face and a roof over my head, I can't possibly go out and be an activist at the same time. And it's arrogant for me to tell somebody that that's what they should do. They should just be spending all of their time dismantling the system. What is the alternative? Because you really have two choices. You can either dismantle the system brick by brick or play the game. And you can't dismantle a system without understanding it. You can't dismantle the system without engaging in it. You can't dis- dismantle the system. You, you, you're never going to be able to win a game if you don't know the rules and the loopholes and where you fit in and how you can navigate and get over. The crux of what I talk about on this show is how I utilized the white clinicians that I had to work with who were stepping stones to get me to be at a place that I, I could be autonomous in my career and work with my community. I spoke last week at an um, event. Shout out to Parents with Teens uh, for, for inviting me to Bedford Academy to come and talk to the group of parents about therapeutic interventions for, for teenagers as well as themselves. But there was one lonely white woman and I had to be honest with them in the group. And I said, Hey, I am a clinician of color who, who works with majority clients of color in my community. And I grew up in old bed style. So was, we had black history, which I didn't think was, was a radical idea. We had a, a black, I had a black, I had black ministers, homeowners, all I knew all the homeowners in the neighborhood, they were all black. My grandfather owned mad property. My father, my aunties, my, my mother, my stepfather, my grandparents. Like I grew up in this kind of environment of, of black autonomy. And so coming back to, to I'm getting emotional, coming back to best out to be a therapist in, in my community, being able to treat people who I know intimately. Not because I know them know them, but because I know their stories. I know their histories. I know we have a shared cultural identity. And to to listen to them tell me about the issues that they face at moving around in black skin. And in a community that used to be black that is now gentrified and not knowing their place in society, I hold a space for them. So to negate all of what black clinicians who are radically 
proudly black. And I will say, I don't know all black clinicians all across the globe, but I will say that there is probably a majority of black clinicians across the globe who do what I do rather than what she is talking about. If you are listening to me and you are interested in learning about black psychologists and schools of black psychological thoughts, I'm going to just read off some names of some things and some people that you can look into. Naeem Akbar, Irene Atwell. Uh -uh, I must have to skip that name, y'all. I can't pronounce it. Sorry. (laughs) Albert Sidney Beckman. John Henry Broodhead or Broadhead, Herman George Kennedy, Kenneth and Mamie Clark. Hey, I know them. Robert Prentice Daniel, Aaron Wendell Eagleson, Carlton Benjamin Godlet, Ruth Winifred Howard, Ja A. Jahanes, Martin David Jenkins, Reginald L. Jones. Ruth G. King, Howard Hale Long, Wade Nobles, John Igbizian, Oshudi, I had to sound that out, y'all, Inez Beverly Prasa, Francis Cecil Sumner, Charles Henry Thompson, Alberta Banner Turner, Frederick Payne Watts, Bobby E. Wright, Howard Emery Wright. Um, I've also studied myself under um, Reverend Billings. He is not black, but I can talk to to you about him another time. But he does an undoing racism workshop here in New York. Those are those are just some. I think I want to say everybody knows about Francis Creese Welling. Well, sing, I'm sorry. She was an Afrocentric psychiatrist. She's the author of the ISIS paper and keys to the color. Who else? Who else? Dr. Kenneth Hardy. He is a PhD and he works at Drexel University. He does a lot of Afrocentric therapy. So if you're looking, if you are a therapist and you've never heard of these people, I suggest that you look into them. If you are not a black therapist, I also suggest that you add them to your repertoire. Dr. Joy DeGruy, 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 I don't know how to say her name. I'm sorry, y'all. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. She's another one that you want to look at. I love her. I can't wait to see her, see her speak. I've done a lot of, I've studied a lot of her talks. Kenneth Hardy, I've seen speak. Also, uh, Dr. Kawanza Kanjufu. If you raise black boys, uh, this was actually the first book that I've ever read that made me want to get into psychology. He has a book anthology called Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. If you raise a black son, me being a mother as a black son, the book, like I have the Holy Ghost and all kind of things reading this book. So Dr. Kawanza Kanjufu, and it's horrible to spell, so I can't, I'm not going to spell it, but I do know that that's how you pronounce it. And the book is called Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. If you want to be a clinician who is a clinician of color and a clinician that is going to make changes and decolonize and dismantle the system, I suggest that you be in it. You be in it. And while I I don't disagree with the premise of what she was trying to say, I do think she made some accurate points. I do think that the post was extremely general and it it had the ability to turn people away from therapy by dismissing the ideas that a lot of people are dismissing it for what people think it is. It it was just kind of like playing into the base almost. And while I, I am not a clinician that will say that everything she said was wrong because I don't believe that everything that she said was wrong. I think that the forum, the tenor and the tone of how she communicated Everything in general, as if this is what all therapists do, was bullshit. It was bullshit. And we as black clinicians specifically, we need to, if you truly love your community, then you have to be as specific as possible 
to not color this experience for people of color. I am one of those people that can tell you and I can tell you that a lot of people that I know can tell you black that therapy has saved their lives. And I, I am lucky enough to have a culturally competent therapist who is not black, but I know that that is a rarity. I know, I know he's a unicorn in that way. But I also know that there are other white clinicians that I have worked with who are culturally competent, who are definite allies, who want to learn from us, who recognize and understand that the client is the authority over their culture and over their story. And we are only there to help them. Okay. So I hope that you've uh, liked it. <laughs> I hope that you liked the show. It felt very, really, really long. I was tripping over my words and everything. I'm tired. I'm still in birthday mode. So I'm going to go out somewhere and find myself something to, to eat and something to drink right now. But I just really want you guys to know that there, we, there are a lot of us out here who are doing the work. And I want you to give therapy a chance. If you haven't gone to therapy, if you've, you've been curious about it, I have a course that I talk about what happens in your first therapy session. I have a course where we talk about how to support friends and family members who have uh, are newly diagnosed, how to support yourself if you're newly diagnosed, what to expect from your first session. It's, uh, it's, it's on my website. It's called Mentally Fit. And you can go on NikitaBanks.com and get a link to the course. The course is free. You can also go on BlackTherapistPodcast.com and there should be a link there. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. If you haven't joined our mailing list, make sure to consider now. Uh, if you want the course, I can send it to you. If you join the mailing list, I, I answer every single email on our mailing list. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be running a opportunity that you will be able to work directly with me for low cost and uh free options okay because uh, you know y'all know i want to give back y'all know i'm always giving y'all back oh oh and if you <laughs> want to advertise at the show make sure you contact me uh, directly, we are growing this year. We have over a hundred thousand downloads. We will do. Uh, I suggest we'll do double that this, you know, in the next year. If not more than that, I'm trying to get to a half a million this year, and I think we can do it. But um, if you guys want to advertise with the, on the show, make sure to contact me as well. Okay, all right, be well, bye. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Black Therapist Podcast. Once again, you can follow us on all our social media sites at Black Therapist Podcast on Instagram and on Twitter, as well as Black in Therapy on Facebook. Or you can follow your host, me, Miss M-S-N-I-K-I, thanks, on Instagram and Twitter, as well as you can find out any information about me at Nikita, N-I-K-I-T-A, banks.com, and on the show's website, Black Therapist podcast.com and don't forget if you want to send us any general feedback show suggestions uh, show topics or guest ideas please feel free to drop us an email at blacktherapistpodcast at gmail.com thank you be well